Okay, guys, your life right now is already set. So you've already programmed your mind from the past to create your future. But you have the privilege now of changing it. And I wanted to get into something, an excerpt out of um, the Thinking Fourth Dimensionally from Neville Goddard. And I wanted to share this with you because it goes right, it coincides with that and it lines right up with that. And I just wanted to explain a little bit better about this and about how your imaginal acts create your future either unconsciously or consciously so you're creating everything in your life that is happening to you like tomorrow it's already been created okay so the next week has already been created next year has already been created but you have the privilege now of changing it and i really want to get into depth and detail about that all changes take place in consciousness the future although prepared in every detail in advance has several outcomes at every, at every moment of our lives, we have before us the choice of which of several futures we will choose. There are two actual outlooks on the world possessed by everyone, a natural focus and a spiritual focus. The ancient teachers called the one the carnal mind, the other the mind of Christ. Christ, we may di differentiate them as ordinary waking conscious consciousness governed by our senses and a controlled imagination governed by desire. We recognize these two distinct centers of thought in this statement. The natural man receiveth not other things of spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, for they are spiritually discerned. The natural view confines reality to the moment called now. To the natural view, the past and future are purely imaginary. The spiritual view, on the other hand, sees the contents of time. It sees events as distinct and separated as objects in space. The past and future are a present whole to the spiritual view. What is mental and subjective to the natural man is concrete and objective to the spiritual man. The habit of seeing only that which our senses permit renders us totally blind to what we otherwise could see. To cultivate a faculty of seeing the invisible, we should often deliberately disentangle our minds from the evidence of the senses and focus our attention on an invisible state. Mentally feeling and sensing sensing it until it has the distinctness of reality. Earnest, concentrated thought focused in a particular direction shuts out all other sensation and causes them to disappear. We have but to concentrate on the state desired in order to see it. The habit of withdrawing attention from the region of sensation and concentrating on the invisible develops our spiritual outlook and enables us to penetrate beyond the world of sense and to see that which is invisible for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, Romans 1.12. This vision is completely independent of natural faculties. Open it and quicken it. Without it, these instructions are useless. For the things of the spirit are spiritually discerned. A little practice, guys, a little bit of practice will convince us that we can, by controlling our imagination, reshape our future in harmony with our desire. Desire is the mainspring of action. We should not move a single finger unless we had a desire to move it. So you have to have a desire to move move your hand or your fingers, okay? Okay. We can break a habit. Our desire to break, break it is, is greater than our desire to continue in the habit. The desire which impel us to action are those that hold our attention. A desire is but an awareness of something we lack or need to make our life more enjoyable. Desires always have some personal gain in view. The greater the anticipated gain, the more intense the desire. There is no absolutely unselfish desire. Where there is nothing to gain, there is no desire and consequently no action. All right. The spiritual man speaks to the, to the natural man through the language of desire. The key to progress in life and to the fulfillment of dreams lies in ready obedience to its voice. Unhesitating obedience to its voice is an immediate assumption of the wish fulfilled. To desire a state is to have it. As Pascal has said, you would not have sought me had you not already found me. Man, by assuming the feeling of his wish fulfilled and then living and acting on this convi conviction, alters the future in harmony with his assumption. Assumption awakes what they affirm, wakens what they affirm. As soon as a man assumes the feeling of his wish fulfilled, his four-dimensional self finds ways for the attainment of this end, discovers methods for its realization. I know of no clear definition definition of the means by which we realize our desire than to experience in imagination what we would experience in the flesh were we to achieve our goal. This experience of the end wills the means. With its larger outlook, the four-dimensional self then constructs the, the means necessary to realize the accepted end. 
the undisciplined mind finds it difficult to assume a state which is denied by the senses. Here is a technique that makes it, makes it easy to encounter events before they occur. To call things which are not seen as though they were, people have a habit of sliding the importance of simple things. So here is a technique, guys. Here's a technique that makes it easier to encounter events before they occur. But simple, this is a simple formula for changing the future was discovered after years of searching and experimenting. First step in changing the future is desire. That is, define the objective, know definitely what you want. Secondly, construct an event which you would believe you would encounter following the fulfillment of your desire. An event which implies fulfillment of your desire. Something that will have the action of self-predominant. Thirdly, immobilize the physical body and induce a, in a condition akin to sleep. Lie in a bed or relax in a chair and imagine that you are sleepy. Then, with eyelids closed and your attention focused on the action you intend to experience in imagination, fill yourself right into the proposed action, imagining all the while that you are actually performing the action here and now. You must always participate in the imaginary action, not merely stand back and look on, but you must feel that you are actually performing the action so that the imaginary sensation is real to you. It is important always to remember that the proposed action must be one that follows the fulfillment of your desire. And also, you must feel yourself into the action until it has all the vividness and distinctness of reality. For example, suppose you desired a promotion in office. Being congratulated would be an event you would encounter following the fulfillment of your desire. Having selected this action as the one you will experience in imagination, immobilize the physical body and induce a state akin to sleep, a drowsy state, but one in which you are still able to control the direction of your thoughts. A state in which you are attentive without effort. Now imagine that a friend is standing before you. Put your imaginary hand into his. First, feel it to be solid and real in your imagination, guys. Then carry on an imaginary conversation within, in harmony with the action. Do not visualize yourself at a distance in point of space and at a distance in point of time being congratulated on your good fortune. Instead, make elsewhere here and the future now. The future event is a reality now in a dimensionally larger world. And oddly enough, now in a dimensionally larger world is equivalent to here in the ordinary three-dimensional space of everyday life. The difference between feeling your, yourself in action here and now and visualizing and visualizing yourself in action as though you were in a motion picture screen is the difference between success and failure. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read that one more time. Okay, the difference between feeling yourself in action here and now and visualizing yourself in action as though you were in a motion picture screen is the difference that's thinking from it and of it. Okay, that's the difference between those two. Is the difference between success and failure. The difference will be appreciated if you will now visualize yourself climbing a ladder. Oh, back to the ladder. Okay, then with eyelids closed, imagine that a ladder is right in front of you and feel you are actually climbing it. Desire physical immobility bordering on sleep, an imaginary action in which self-feelingly predominates. Here and now are, are not only important factors in altering the future, but they are essential conditions in consciously projecting the spiritual self. If when the physical body is immobilized, we become possessed of the idea to do something, and imagine that we are doing it here and now and keep the imaginary action feelingly going right up into and until sleep ensues. We are likely to awaken out of the physical body to find ourselves in a dimensionally larger world with a dimensionally larger focus and actually doing what we desired and imagined we were doing in the flesh. But whether we awaken there or not, we are actually performing the action in the fourth dimensional world and we will reenact it in the future here in the three dimensional world. Experience has taught me to restrict the imaginary action to condense the idea, which is to be the object of your meditation into a single act and to reenact it over and over again until it has a feeling of reality. Otherwise, the attention will wander off along an associational, associational track and hosts of associated images will be presented to our attention. In a few seconds, they will lead us hundreds of miles away from our objective in a point of space and years away in point of time. If we decide to climb a particular flight of stairs because that is the likely event to follow the realization of our desire, then we must restrict the action to climbing the particular flight of stairs. Should our attention wander off, we must bring it 
bring it back to its task of climbing that flight of stairs and keep on doing so until the imaginary action has all the solid is solid and distinctness of reality. The idea must be maintained in the field of presentation without any sensible effort on your part. We must, with the minimum of effort, permeate the mind with the feeling of the wish fulfilled. Drowsiness facilitates change because it favors attention without effort, but it must be pushed to the stage of sleep in which we shall no longer be able to control the movements of our attention, but rather a moderate degree of drowsiness in which we are still able to direct our thoughts. A most effective way to embody a desire is to assume the feeling of the wish fulfilled and then in a relaxed and sleepy state, repeat over and over again like a lullaby. I like that. Like a lullaby, any short phrase which implies fulfillment of your desire, such as thank you, as though we addressed a higher power for having done it for us. If, however, we seek the conscious projection into a dimensionally larger world, then we must accept the action going right up until sleep ensues. Experience in imagination with all the distinctness of reality that would be experienced in the flesh were you to achieve your goal, and you shall, in time, meet it in the flesh as you met in your imagination. Feed the mind with premises, that is, assertions presumed to be true, because assumptions, though unreal to the senses, if persisted in until they have the feeling of reality, will harden into fact. To an assumption, all means which promote its realization are good. It influences the behavior of all by inspiring in all the movements, the actions, and the words which tends to, which tend towards its fulfillment. To understanding how man molds his future in harmony with his assumption, we must know that when we mean, when we meet what we mean by the dimensionally larger world, for it is so dimensionally large a world that we what we go to alter our future. The observation of an event before it occurs implies that the event is predetermined from the point of view of man in the three-dimensional world. Therefore, to change the conditions here in the three dimensions of space, we must first change them in the four dimensions of space. The four dimensions of space. Oh, this is really good right here. Man does not know exactly what is meant by the four, the four dimensionally larger world and would no doubt deny the existence of a dimensionally larger self. He is quite familiar with three dimensions of length, width, and height. He feels that if there were a fourth dimension, it should be just as obvious to him as the dimensions of length, width, and height. A dimension is not a line. It is in any way in which a thing can be measured that is entirely different from all other ways. That is, to measure a solid fourth dimensionally, we imply we simply measure it in any direction except that of its length, width, and height. Is there any other way to measure an object other than length, width, and height? Yes, there is. Time. Time measures my life without employing the three dimensions of length, width, and height. There is no such thing as an instantaneous object. Its appearance and disappearance are measurable. It endures for the definite length of time. We can measure its lifespan without using the dimensions of length, width, and height. Time is definitely a fourth way of measuring an object. The, the more dimensions an object has, the more substantially substantial and real it becomes. A straight line, which lies entirely in one dimension, acquires shape, mass, substance by the addition of dimensions. What new quality would, would time, the fourth dimension, give would, would make it just as vastly superior to solids as solids are to surfaces and surfaces are to lines. Time is a medium for changes in experience because all changes take time. The new quality is changeability. Observe that if we, this is really good. It's really hard to understand, but um, I, I suggest you re, um, replay this video more than once if you don't understand it. Observe that if we bisect a solid, its cross-section will be a surface. By bisecting a surface, we obtain a line, and by bisecting a line, we get a point. This means that a point is but a cross-section of a line, which is in turn but a cross-section of a surface which is in turn but a cross-section of a solid, which is in turn, if carried to its logical conclusion, but a cross-section of a four-dimensional object. We cannot avoid the interference that all three-dimensional objects are but cross-sections of four-dimensional bodies, which means when I meet you, I meet a cross-section of the four-dimensional you, the four-dimensional self that is not seen. 
To see the four dimensional self, I must see every cross section or moment of your life from birth to, to death. So in order for me to know you guys or you to know me in the fourth dimension of, of space, it would you would have to know me or see me from the day I was born to the day that I died all at one time. Okay? So I made a cross section of the four dimensional of, of self that is not seen. To the four dimensional self, I see uh, every cross section or moment of your life from birth to death and see them as all coexisting. My focus should take in the entire array of sensory impressions which you have experienced on earth, plus those you might encounter. I should see them not in the order in which they were experienced by you, but as a present whole, because change is the characteristic of the fourth dimension. I should see them in a state of flux as living and animated whole. If we have all this clearly fixed in our minds, what does it mean to us? Okay, so we have we understand all this. What does it mean to us? That's what that's the bottom line here. What does this mean? Okay, it means that if we can move along time's length, we can see the future and alter it as we so desire. This world, which we think so solidly real, is a shadow out of which and beyond which we may at any time pass. It is an abstraction from a more fundamental and dimensionally larger world, a more dimensional world. A more dimensional world or fundamental abstract from a still more fundamental and dimensionally larger world and so on to infinity. The absolute is unattainable by any means or analysis no matter how many dimensions we add to the world. Man can prove the existence of a dimensionally larger world. See, this is how you can prove it to you, okay? You prove it to yourself. Man can prove the existence of a dimensionally larger world but simply by focusing his attention on an invisible state and imagining that, that he sees and feels it. If he remains concentrated in this state, his present environment will pass away and he will awaken in a dimensionally larger world where the object of his contemplation will be seen as a concrete objective reality. Intuitively, I feel that were he to abstract his thoughts from his dimensionally larger world and retreat still further within his mind, he would again bring about an externalization of time he would discover that every time he retreats into his inner mind and brings about an externalization of time, space becomes dimensionally larger, and he would therefore conclude that both time and space are serial or unreal, and that the drama of life is but climbing of a multitudinous dimensional time block. Scientists will one day explain why there is a, a serial universe or unreal universe, but in practice, how we use the serial universe is to change the future is and is much more important. To change the future, we need only concern ourselves with two worlds in the infinite series. The world we know by reason of our bodily organs and the world we perceive independently of our bodily organs. All right, guys, I really wanted to share this. This is out of, out of this world. This is uh, thinking fourth dimensionally out of this world. One of my favorite chapters, actually my grandfather's... Um, first book um, from Neville Goddard from his meetings that he picked up uh, thinking fourth dimensionally this is really awesome um, you need to really really I, I encourage you guys to really really go over this chapter and uh, re-listen to this many many times if you don't have this book or if you can't read the book or you just you just want to absorb the information just replay this and um, just just keep it in your mind and if you guys have any questions or comments you'd like me reading more of this stuff and I know this is a longer video but I can do longer ones if you guys want when I'm doing readings like this. That way you can just kind of play them, you know, and just completely submerge yourself and, and just absorb this information. That way we can get to that level of naturalness and change the conception of ourself and really, really apply this. So because the more you use it or the more you absorb the information, the easier it is to actually um, apply it into your life. And um, the more discipline that you will attain or attain from it or get from it. And uh, all right, guys, I love you. And... And uh, tell me what you think about this. Give me a thumbs up. And uh, I love you guys. And uh, more, more videos coming. Thank you.